Thank you, Jay. And thank you for everyone who's uh, sitting at breakfast or lunch, wherever you are in the world. I appreciate you sitting in. Uh, the goal of creating uh, this, this research was uh, basically twofold. I wanted to, first of all, understand further the role of ideology in negotiation and conflict resolution during the four Tuareg rebellions. But also, I wanted to make sure that it was relevant and it was something that uh, war fighters and other people in the area could use. Now, if we look at this map of Azawad, you can see that there's a, a breakaway state in Mali called Azawad. And this happened after the Four Tuareg Rebellion. And uh, what's, what's interesting to note is that uh, you have uh, four countries around it. Uh, Mauritania really doesn't play a huge role in it. Algeria does, Niger, and Burkina Faso, uh, as well as Mali. Those are the four main countries where you're going to find the different uh, Tuareg groups, uh, with the exception of Burkina Faso. There's a very small minority there. This was independent research, and it was conducted under Dr. Kevin Grisham. Uh, he's a, uh, a professor at the Social Science Department at uh, Cal State San Bernardino. And uh, my goal in creating this research uh, was uh, to uh, draw on experience where I was researching the Arab Honor Code. What I did is I looked at the, uh, the Bedouin uh, pre-Islamic culture and uh, their, their honor codes involving Sharaf and Ud. And uh, I also compared that with Pashtun Wali, which is the honor code of the uh, Pashtun in Afghanistan. And uh, the Baluch in Baluchistan, Pakistan, have a honor code called Baluch Mi'ar. Uh, that led me to uh, looking at the Somalis' uh, similar honor code, which is Somali Zir. And uh, after looking at all those different things, I realized what was important was to look at the role that ideology appears to play uh, within the uh, area of Middle East and Africa. And that's pretty much my area of concentration is uh, within those two regions because there's a lot of conflict over the years. And this is part of a more general question, probably something I may use in my doctoral dissertation. Uh, you know, what is the role that ideology has played in negotiation and conflict resolution? And it appears through the research that uh, it does play a pretty major role. Now there's the old Tuareg proverb, houses are the grades of the living. And basically what that means is uh, the Tuareg are pastoral. They are nomadic and they look at, I guess kind of like you and me, they look at uh, uh, living in cities as being dead. Uh, their, their, whole, their whole culture is based on being nomadic and, and living off the land and so the thought of being sedentarized and urbanized, or what they call it, decentralized, uh, to them would be akin to being dead. So in 2000 BC, there were the Berbers that were present in the Maghreb. And the Berbers are a generic uh, representation of the different people throughout North Africa, including uh, West Africa, the Sahel region. And the Tuareg ascend from the Berber tribe the languages that they use um, are Tamashek primarily, and actually they don't like being called Tuareg. Uh, they like to be called Kel Tamashek or uh, uh, Kel Tagwomus, which uh, really refers to their clothing. Tamashek meaning people who speak Tamashek. There is an evolution of the Berber ideology, the, the pre-Islamic ideology, and there was a huge impact at the advent of Islam on the Berbers and as well as the Tuaregs. And uh, that becomes apparent when uh, the, uh, the Umayyads they converted people to Islam. The goal of that was to bring together different ethnicities, primarily Arab, but other ethnicities as well, under the religion of Islam. Now it's questionable whether Islam outweighs uh, the role of pre-Islamic ideology in a lot of the different groups uh, that I've researched. Uh, some of them actually do hold Islam to be more important 
in their pre-Islamic culture, and others it, it, it isn't. It's actually, it, it plays a second chair, so to speak. So um, the Tuareg and Arab ideology were two of the things that I, I compared when I was going through the research. Um, if you look at the pre-Islamic ideology of the Arabs, um, theirs was based on uh, two things, which is Sharaf and Urd, and what that is is basically honor of the woman, the closest male agnate, was responsible for the honor of the woman. Uh, there wasn't something similar to that in the Tuareg, but was similar between the Tuareg and the Arabs were the fact that they were both pastoral, they were both nomadic, and uh, because of that, uh, it, it, make, it makes sense why their, uh, the, the Islamic culture wasn't able to completely adhere, and a lot of their pre-Islamic culture uh, stays around through, uh, through their current uh, culture. You can see a lot of, lots of the pre-Islamic culture that plays a part in their uh, current Islamic uh, uh, their culture, their, their current culture. And so because they were nomads, uh, and because uh, I, I argue But the Tuareg, on the other hand, have kept their nomadic culture. And so uh, it's either because of the fact that they're nomadic and they're not urbanized, or it could be from the fact that they didn't have direct contact with the Maraboots from the Umayyad dynasty. And since they didn't have contact with them, uh, they actually had contact with the merchants that had contact with the Maraboots, so not a direct connection, then uh, that may be the reason why they don't completely adhere to uh, Islam. They're actually, um, they are Muslim, and so you can't say they're not Muslim, but uh, they're, they're a different brand of Muslim because of the fact that they're Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice. And, uh, and we'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that compared to most uh, cultures that have Islam as uh, a major component of their culture, uh, they are into secularism, and that's what I found fascinating about the Tuareg compared to a lot of the different groups that I've researched. So uh, sedentarization, urbanization had the opposite effect uh, because of the fact that uh, there are some that live in cities, but most of them are still uh, uh, nomadic. And, and it, that hasn't changed it. So it, it may actually change the reason of why uh, they're, they're not as Islamic as some uh, other groups out there. Now, why is it important to understand the role that, that these ideologies play in Tuareg rebellions? That was one of the reasons what I was looking at. And I think it's important because of the current conflict in Mali and, and uh, because we have conflicts in, in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, more than likely it's going to play a huge role in negotiation conflict resolution uh, for years and years to come. So it's important to understand the roles in not just the Tuareg rebellions but other uh, conflicts as well. And so the, one of the questions I came up with was, does the pre-Islamic Berber Tuareg culture still play a part in the Tuareg community today? And, and that's kind of questionable still, but uh, it does appear that a lot of it does. Now, the Tuareg people are Muslim. And um, the interesting thing is, like I said, they're secularists. So they, they don't accept Sharia law. In other words, uh, they don't want uh, they, they live with a bunch of different people, the Songhai, the Moors, uh, and, they, and they don't want to, uh, to impose their religion on everyone else. So they're, that's why they're secularists, because they understand the, uh, the, the current setup within their area of all these different cultures, that it wouldn't work. It, it would cause conflict. And, and uh, I believe that's the reason why they're secular. Uh, another reason would probably be because uh, uh, there is a Sufism uh, within that area, which uh, seems to be a little more spiritual than uh, a lot of the more radical Islamic uh, cultures you look at. So, uh, the proximity. Uh, with the Berbers, there was a, 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 a language component similar. You know, they speak Berber, they speak Tamashek. So that's what I used to fill in a lot of those gaps. 
Now, uh, Islam has had an effect on the, the Berber or Tuareg culture, um, and, and that's one of the, the other things that I was looking at, was what kind of effect uh, you know, Islam had on the, the, the pre-Islamic culture, and, and it has had an effect. But uh, I, I argue that their culture is more important, their nomadic uh, pastoral origin is more important than, their, uh, than being a Muslim is, which is the reason why there's Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice. And then the most important question, probably why most of us are listening today, is uh, how does it affect security and stability in the North African region? And we'll talk a little bit more towards the end about uh, current developments and uh, also why France would get involved, because that's a question that's asked quite a bit about it. So I started out with two hypotheses. I used uh, the fact that ideology is an underlying variable, and uh, but it's not the main variable. And I looked at the fact that maybe ideology is the main variable, um, but there's other variables that affect the process. And in a minute, I'll talk about how both of these hypotheses were incorrect. <laughs> as happens in social science, a lot of times you start out with a certain idea, and it changes as you start doing the research. So then I looked at when these people that are not Taurus, so the non Taurigs, uh, are dealing with the Tuaregs, um, was it important for them to adhere to the, the ideology or the culture? And, and if they did, if there were evidence of that, was it successful? And then, of course, the opposite would be that it doesn't lead to a more successful conclusion through adherence. So my research focused exclusively on the four Tuareg rebellions. And these were, this is started in the 1960s after France left uh, Mali and uh, basically handed over to the Mali government. Uh, I looked at the history of ideology within Tuareg and Berber population. I uh, looked at the role of ideology in, in the conflicts and the, the play within the process. And I used academic and military journals and books, as well as past essays on armed conflict and negotiation process. One of which was from a Mali colonel, and uh, it was uh, basically talking about the four rebellions, not looking at the role of ideology, but explaining uh, Mali's role in the four different rebellions. And, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that, because there, I did talk to, uh, at, before this presentation, I want to make sure that I'm providing the right information here, and as an academic, I always want to make sure that uh, I'm correct. and. And uh, you know, at least I, I, I approach it with the, the uh, with trying to be correct with my information. So I did talk to a uh, a Tuareg expert, and this is someone who was a Berber, and he lived with the Tuareg. So he's very familiar with a lot of these things, and I was able to bounce a lot of. He read my paper, and uh, he gave me some of his input on it, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I looked at geographically how ideology played a role in each armed conflict, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and then for the sake of brevity, I mean, I would love to do <laughs> look at the whole Middle East and Africa, you know, and just spend years and years on the research. But uh, you probably wouldn't read that research because it'd be, you know, thousands of pages. Uh, so my goal was I'll start out with just the ones that are important right now in our current uh, environment and hopefully over time uh, put together some type of book based on those uh, different uh, conflicts. So the strengths of it. The strengths were that there was a lot of research done on the Berbers, uh, not much done on the Tuareg. And uh, because there was a lot of research done on the Berbers, it helps me make a connection between the two. And what I did is I connected the Tuareg's uh, language, their proximity, and uh, because of that, I was able to uh, plug in a lot of the gaps of knowledge that were missing. And uh, there was a lack of research done on the negotiation process, unfortunately. Uh, the, the primary um, document that I drew off of, uh, other than some other uh, uh, minor documents, was the one by the Mali colonel based on uh, the, uh, the person who had actually uh, done the research on it and been in the region being a Mali, and I figured uh, would probably have a pretty good idea, but I did take into account that some people put biases into their research, and I'm not saying that the Mali colonel did that, but that was something that was in the back of my mind as I was uh, putting that into my paper. And it's probably something you should probably look at, too, while you're reading 
uh, uh, any any anything that's written by a country, that there's going to be some type of bias. Um, now, there was barely enough data to create a complete picture of the four Tuareg rebellions um, and the ideological component. And again, that was that was one of the weaknesses, but it was filled in by uh, uh, the fact that there was a lot of Berber um, information out there and the, the Mali colonel's uh, information, as well as uh, other sources. Um, now, I, obviously, uh, I would love to uh, try, you know, go out there to Mali and, and speak, uh, you know, with the Tuareg itself and get their side, and I think that would have added some credibility to the paper, and I felt that was a, a weakness, unfortunately, because of the conflict in the region and the funding, uh, you know, time available for the research, uh, wasn't able to do that. Maybe that's something I could do in the future. Uh, and uh, at the time, the expert that I spoke to prior to uh, this presentation uh, was out of the country, so I was unable to secure an interview with him. And uh, so hopefully through the showing of a connection between the Berbers and Tuareg in my research, uh, I was a actually able to alleviate some of those weaknesses. So here's some of the updated information. So I spoke to uh, a Tuareg expert, his name's Hamid Lalu. And, uh, uh, Hamid, uh, actually, he's a Berber, and he lived with the Tuareg. And so I, I think that gives him some credibility. Also, Hamid is at Central Command, and he works, uh, I did an internship for the uh, United States Marine Corps Center for Advanced Operational Culture Language. And uh, what they're doing is something similar to what I like to do, which is I think it's important to understand the culture. Uh, one of the things I think we went to Iraq is uh, we had a lot of policymakers at the time that didn't know the difference between Shia and Sunni. Uh, there were some people that were making decisions that weren't aware that there were three different, uh, uh, you know, the, the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds that uh, would have caused some issues. They didn't understand the Ba'ath issue. Uh, so because of that, I think it's important that for future conflicts that we do have experts in the area that understand the different cultures, the role that ideology has played in their past revolutions, things like that, and just really understand what's going on so that these lawmakers for our next war, whether it's the United States or some other country that, that wants to use this information, that they at least uh, understand what's going on for a more successful conclusion. So there were two things that Hamid talked about. And this is what kind of negates my first two hypotheses, and that's the fact that ideology is a major variable, but it's dependent, and that's dependent on financial and economical variables. And, and this comes from the fact that Mali had a huge problem, and we'll talk more in length about this, but they had a huge problem when they first took over from uh, French occupation, and that dealt primarily with the fact of routinization. Uh, routinization is basically the, uh, the providing of basic government services that you and I take for granted, and uh, I guess Molly did too. Um, they weren't ready to run a country, and I think because of that, uh, the Tuareg felt that either they were being uh, left behind or ignored, and, and uh, that really started one of the first rebellions, among other things. And the second thing is uh, the Mali Colonel's paper. Uh, there was a claim that Islamists entered into northern Mali in the 1990s. And actually, that didn't occur until 2000, actually after 2000. The most likely uh, time that they entered would have been after September 11, 2001. And the reason why is because after September 11, 2001, when the attacks happened on the World Trade Center, uh, the United States government assisted Algeria in uh, removing a lot of the Islamist rebels. And, uh, and through that, the Islamist rebels got pushed from, north, from uh, Algeria north down into south of Algeria, which is Mali. And that's more likely when a lot of the Islamist problems uh, arose. So this is based on literature review. This is the first complete examination of the role that ideology plays within conflict resolution and negotiation during the Tuareg rebellions. Uh, again, there's lack of documentation the Tuareg pre-Islam, re so it required tracing the Tuaregs to Berbers who settled in the Maghreb in 2000 BC. 
And so the nomadic lifestyle, the Berber and the Tuareg, um, uh, and the lack of connection to Marabouts, the Islamic scholars during the Umayyad dynasty, allowed them not to fully adhere to Islam, unlike other cultures in the Maghreb, such as Somalia. Although, uh, if you're aware of Somalia, it's a, it's a variety of different Sufi sects, so it's very similar in some ways. But as far as the uh, the role that Islam plays in the Tuareg compared to Somalia, uh, Somalia is a lot more Islamic, probably more uh, likely to adhere to Islamic law than uh, uh, they are. Um, they are nomadic, pastoral, secularism. It's a very important thing. So while while they are Muslims, secularism is very very important to keep in mind. Um, and obviously, the pre-Islamic ideology um, is something that's going to have to have further research done. But uh, just like if you look at um, what happened uh, in Iraq uh, with not understanding the culture, and, 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 and some would argue in Afghanistan, um, it's important to understand those because you could actually exacerbate a conflict and make it worse than it is. Um, also, if you don't understand uh, certain things about a culture, um, you could end up creating a uh, a bigger mess or misunderstanding a uh, a conflict as being uh, terrorist motivated when it's really just based on honor or based on some type of a cultural indifference. So it's important to understand, I think, the pre-Islamic ideology and their culture. So some of the unanswered questions that I had. Uh, and I'm still not sure about this, and this is something that will probably be answered in the in the future. Um, but uh, the most important question uh, that remains, or you know, is, is the the lack of urbanization, sedentarization, and uh, it's either that or the fact that the Maraboots weren't able to have direct contact with them, and so um, that's that's a little bit uh, different uh, when it comes to. Uh, when it comes to understanding why they're they're secular, I think that may be the reason. It may have more to do with the Islamic scholars skipping the mountains, not having direct contact. Um, actually, um, Ibn Khaldun had a thing called Four Generations Removed, and it uh, part of that uh, dealt with the fact that the grandfather may not have uh, as much influence on the great grandson, and uh, that comes from a lack of connection. So it may be something similar when it comes to religion, but that kind of remains to be seen. Um, so because of a lack of urbanization and uh, not due to lack of contact with Islamic scholars, um, you know, it, it, it may result in a culture that has a much stronger adherence to Islam than nomadic counterparts. Questions and, and I wanted to make sure that you understood that that it's uh, it's it's an unanswered question. It's important, I think, to understand why um, because I think that might help in understanding how to deal with uh, the, the Tuareg better. So first of all, I'm just going to go through a basic conflict resolution. You know, it's a process that leads to peace. Um, uh, peace talks are assuming the outcome will be peace, and that's something that. Uh, um, uh, someone had said at, at one point that uh, you know if you're having peace talks, you're you're proposing that you're wanting peace, and and that may not always be the case in peace talks, but uh, that's what people in both parties or all parties involved are assuming. But conflict resolution is best understood to be the communication or bargaining and negotiation process between the parties in a conflict. And I put two, but sometimes there's more. Um, and it's more most important for it to be a win-win. And and uh, win-win doesn't mean it has to be 50-50. It could be 60-80, 70-30, as long as both feel that they get something out of it. Uh, in most cases, uh, that's usually a successful resolution. So, if conflict resolution is the overall process, then the negotiation is actually the the uh, internal communication and the bargaining process. That goes on within the people invol uh, involved in the conflict resolution, and, uh, and and it's the the strategy and the tactics they use to obtain the win-win situation. And ideologies. Now, ideology, and this is kind of interesting. I have this quote I found. 
Um, ideology is essentially linked to the process of sustaining asymmetric relations of power, that is to the process of maintaining dominance. So in a way, ideology uh, is, is primarily a way of control. And, and that becomes important reason to understand why uh, there was a, such a spread of uh, Islam in, in that area and why the Umayyads wanted to spread Islam because it was a thing of maintaining dominance. Uh, under the guise of uniting people, they were maintaining control. Studying ideology means studying conflicting viewpoints while also reflecting on the language, the culture, the politics uh, within the areas studied. Okay, so the, the Tuareg don't like to be called Tuareg, um, and this is something that's important to understand. Uh, they consider themselves to be Keltamishek, which refers to the language that they speak, or Keltagumust, uh, which refers to their clothing. And the Tuareg are located in three primary countries, which are Algeria, Mali, and Niger. Um, they're made up of two types of Muslims, Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice. Now, they're, they're, the Kel Tamashek uh, slash Tuareg confederations, for our purposes as academics and as, uh, as scholars, as, as uh, people working in the area, we can amongst ourselves call them Tuareg because that's what we understand it to be and that's what the media uses and you know, things like that. But when you talk to them and if you're sitting down with a Tuareg, they don't like to be referred to as Tuareg. But for our purpose, we'll use both. So uh, the Kel Tamashek Tuareg confederations are, con are basically com uh, comprised of these. You have the Northern Confederation, which is the Kel Ahagar, which is in Taman Resid, Algeria. Then you have the Kel Ajar, which is uh, in the Janet Elysi, Algeria. And uh, then you have the Southern Confederation, which is a lot larger. And that's made of Kel Adrar, which is in Tasalit, Kidal Mali. You have Kel Tadamakat, which is in Kidal Mali. You have uh, Ilmadin Kel Atazam, which is in Gao Mali. You have Ilmadin Keldinio, which is in North Miami, Niger, and uh, Kelgres, East Mali, and Kel Air, which is in Northern Niger. Um, if you look at the three most important ideologies to Tuareg, uh, they're cultural, religious, and political. Um, cultural, their pre Islamic culture is very important to them. Um, which is which is evident in the fact that most of them are Sufi, and Sufism is very important in the area, um, uh, along with religion. And, and I argue that culture and religion a lot of times has a uh, an overlap. Um, political primarily deals with the secularist uh, part of of the Tuareg um, ideology. They, they're very secular um, compared to most Islamic cultures, and so they are nomadic. They're pastoral. Uh, they live in the areas of Algeria, uh, Mali, and Niger, and the uh, Maghreb. And they were or, excuse me, African uh, indigenous ideology. Um, if you're not familiar with animism, animism is a uh, it was a religion pre-Islam, pre-Judaism pre-Christianity, pre-Zoroastrianism, basically one of the earliest religions where people felt that there was uh, a spirit of God and everything. And uh, so uh, it's kind of interesting how it goes from multiple, uh, multiple um, deities to a monotheistic religion. Um, one of the things that I, I was, I've been tracing in my research. So more than likely in North Africa there were a lot of Jews. So, and Christians. And Judaism and Christianity uh, came before Islam, so more than likely a lot of them were Jews and Christians. And this was confirmed by talking to uh, the expert as well um, regarding that. So, but after the advent of Islam, uh, the Tuareg became Muslim. And uh, again, that's Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice. And so, the ad adherence to Islam of the Tuareg wasn't as strong as those who had contact with the Marabouts, um, and it took place much later because of that. The way that they more likely converted was because they went down and uh, talked to the merchants, saw they were Muslim, and they were converted that way. Um, and it's interesting to note that usually in most regions when uh, the conversion process was going on, 
from whatever their previous uh, religion was, uh, they actually usually um, would uh, convert the rulers first. And I think that helped a lot with legitimacy as well to say that, you know, hey, well, we just converted your king or, or your emir or your sultan. And so um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to look at it that way. That's the reason why uh, you will see a lot of uh, these uh, countries in the Middle East and Africa that are ruled by uh, Islamic uh, people or Islamic shuras. It's because of the fact that the rulers were converted first. And uh, they figured out through ideology it's a good way to control. So, so uh, again, they're not strict Muslims. They do hold on, and they don't like to talk about their earlier religion. So obviously you might not want to talk to them about their animistic religion, whether it was there or not, um, unless they understood the context in which you were asking. They are Muslims, so if you, you, know, you call them Muslims, they'd be okay with that. Um, uh, Christianity or Judaism isn't usually um, something that they want to talk about either, um, but I thought it was important for research to look at that. So the reason why they prefer a secular society is that it's closer to their former animistic religion, um, where uh, you also more likely had a secularist type thing, and, and all the different cultures had their own gods that they worshipped. So, uh, and, and the other thing is that under France, they had autonomy, which is something they don't enjoy um, after France left. Uh, they, they feel actually more oppressed and more forgotten by the country of Mali. Secularism became a problem after the Tuareg seceded from Mali, and there's two reasons. Uh, there was, you had Ansar al-Din, who um, was, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how, that, how that ended up coming into play, but you had two factions. You had MNLA, which was the secularist Tuareg movement, and you had, which was the movement uh, de la Nationale Azawad, and you had um, the Ansar al-Din, which was the more Islamic uh, Tuareg movement. And the more Islamic Tuareg movement, while they did play a part, uh, there was some animosity created there because those people, and primarily uh, Izzar Ghali, uh, which was the leader of the uh, Ansar al-Din movement, uh, he wasn't allowed to join the MNLA because of his close contact between uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb there was concern about them getting involved. And we see later in the rebellion that that was a, uh, that was a real concern, and it was good for the Tuareg to be concerned in that. So technically, there have been So that's why that one wasn't covered. And probably for our purposes, it wasn't that important because the French, uh, other than their current in, uh, role, they really don't play a whole lot uh, within those four rebellions. Uh, the first rebellion was in 1962, and it ended in 1964. The uh, second one was in 1990, and it ended in 1996. And the third one's in 2006, and it ended in 2009. And the fourth was in 2012, and uh, that one's still pretty much uh, going on. Force, and uh, it's it's. But uh, anyway, it's, it's up in the air right now. So the first Tuareg Rebellion. Uh, in 1963, uh, this was after the occupation of France, um, post-colonial Mali put restrictions on the autonomy uh, that was enjoyed by the Kidal Tuareg, uh, which was in Caladag, uh, under French colonization. When they did this, um, they actually went, and, uh, and that was located in Adrar des Flores along the Algerian border. Um, the problem at the time is that the Tuareg enjoy, enjoyed autonomy, and when there were restrictions put on them, uh, they decided they wanted their own country. And they wanted the, their own country of Azawad, which was going to be their country. And there was no, but the problem was at the time there was no political aspiration. There was no reason 
to revolt against uh, against Mali. And since there was no reason to revolt against Mali at the time, uh, there really wasn't any kind of uh, movement toward it. That changes, though, uh, when there's an uprising. And the uprising came from the fact that the uh, uh, they decided they, they did want to kind of push forward with their own country of, of Azawad. Now, these small hit-and-run raids on camel, and they had small arms during the first Tuareg rebellion. And, uh, of course, Mali retaliated. And uh, coming out of um, uh, seeing a lot of the, the Soviet action, they used a lot of Soviet weapons and Soviet tactics. And, and a lot of it was... Uh, I mean, pretty pretty uh, gruesome. I mean, uh, they, they massacred people in the different areas. They poisoned their wells. They destroyed their flock, which was their livelihood. And so that caused a lot of animosity, and that continues today. Uh, that uh, over uh, through generations, that that continues the uh, the, the the horrible things the, that they did through the authoritarian uh, approach to uh, quelling the uh, the Tuareg uprising. So this harsh authoritarian ideology played a role in this rebellion, and unfortunately, it more than likely led to the second rebellion. So what happened at that time is the Tuareg, were, they fled the country. And they were able to flee the country because of the fact that they were uh, not sedentarized or urbanized. And they, they, so they, that was the easiest way to, to get out of uh, being forced uh, into this authoritarian, uh, non-autonomous uh, uh, situation. So they went into surrounding countries, and uh, then there was a drought that happened that actually made a lot of them uh, leave as well um, on top of that. So uh, not just the fact that there was this approach by Mali that was very uh, Soviet-style authoritarian, but it was also the fact that uh, there was a, a double entendre on top of that, which is that they, uh, th the drought actually made it hard for them to live in the area and continue with what they're doing. The Mali government took over from the French occupation and was not able to do the daily activities of the government. Routinization was not moving fast enough, although they may have succeeded in some areas, uh, it just wasn't moving fast enough for them. And so uh, there was this feeling of being left out that maybe they were uh, being mistreated. And, and that, that actually grew until the second Tuareg Rebellion. And so in June 27, 1990, the second began. And this was the catalyst for future rebellions. Uh, it, again, unaddressed grievances. There were grievances over the fact that the government was not uh, doing the, the important things they needed to in government to take care of the people. Uh, there were claims that they were going to provide social programs, and they didn't follow through on those, primarily due to logistical issues, is what the Malian colonel argued. Um, and the lack of involvement between the Tuareg and the government of Mali uh, just really felt like they were kind of just, you know, being ostracized and not, not taken care of. So this perspective uh, may have played a part. As the Mali government claimed to be having trouble with routinization, uh, they felt it was on purpose. And, and uh, food relief was withheld. And of course, during the time there was a drought, that made it even worse, uh, caused a lot of uh, people to be very angry and resulted in the second Tuareg rebellion. So the splintering of the Tuareg community in the 1960s made it much different and more dangerous to the Mali government. And, and that was because young men, after the first rebellion, went into the oil industry. This is when there was a huge oil boom in the area. And others uh, decided they were going to be soldiers for Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's Islamic Legion. the soldiers found themselves out of work and they were restless. So it's very similar to what's going on right now in the Arab Spring, if you think about it. Uh, we have a lot of people that are unemployed in those areas that are restless. It's really the, uh, the revolution of the youth. So the fact that there were uh, young people that were restless, out of work, um, more well-trained now, they had more uh, uh, cap uh, weapons that they were able to use. Um, it was going to be a much more uh, dangerous rebellion if it was to happen, and it was. So uh, this time, the resentment on top of that resulted in a rise in violence 
and this time it wasn't by camels. They used uh, light vehicles, mounted weapons, small arms, uh, kind of hit-and-run tactics uh, against the Malian army. And it was more successful. They destroyed government facilities. Uh, at this point, because the fact that they had already, uh, most, for, uh, most Tuaregs have, a, uh, have three passports for the three different countries, so Algeria, uh, Mali, and Niger, so uh, they could hit and then run to one of those countries and hide. And that's what happened. And that made it very difficult for the country of Mali to be able to uh, fight to quell the uprising. They tried again. The Mali government tried to use the same tactics, the authoritarian type tactics uh, from the first rebellion, and it actually escalated the conflict. And uh, it, they didn't have the same results of quelling. And uh, so what ends up happening is uh, we have Algeria that steps in, uh, probably fearing that it would cross into their border. Uh, they end up signing the uh, Accords of Tamanresa and Tamanresa at Algeria. January 6, 1991, uh, President Treyor of Mali is removed in a coup, and uh, a national pact is signed in Bamako, Mali, in southern Mali, on April 11, 1992. Uh, part of that national pact, um, let's see, um, so, so before we talk about that, uh, the national pact, so leading up to the Third Rebellion, uh, the Mali, Mali government, and this is through the national pact, they struggled to integrate these restless young people into the Malian army, and it was it was uh, it was met with a lot of distrust on the part of the Malian army, the non-Tuareg, because of the uh, the first and second rebellion, and uh, that resulted in internal attacks on non-Tuareg Malian army personnel, and that complicated even further. Uh, it was hard to integrate them because uh, you know kind of like something similar we saw with. Uh, in Afghanistan, where you had some of those uh, soldiers that would attack uh, some of the coalition fighters um, that, that are supposed to be working with them. It's similar to that. Um, not exactly similar, but similar. Um, and this, this actually uh, um, the integration of the Tuareg into the uh, Malian army wasn't complete. It didn't happen in a vacuum. And uh, so some of them felt that they were still being treated differently. So what they ended up doing is they walked out of their military posts with military weapons and military vehicles. Um, the, they were calling for adherence to that national pact. They still felt that they weren't being treated right. It was an equitable distribution of resources in northern Mali, and they were uh, really calling for autonomy uh, that they felt under the French occupation. They wanted that back. Um, now, the Mali government handled this differently through the use of containment and appeasement, and uh, they used mediation through a third party, Algeria. Within a few days, because of uh, using mediation, using a third party, the war was over. Um, the negotiation required the ADC not to collaborate with other Tuareg outside Mali in the conflict and not to push for autonomy or de independence. And because of that, what ends up happening, and this is a, remember this is the third Tuareg rebellion, um, between the third and the fourth Tuareg rebellion, uh, you actually had um, the uh, September 11th to happen. And with that, you had the uh, Salafist group of preaching and combat. And the Salafist group from preaching and combat was a splinter group of the GIA that fought during the Algerian Civil War of the 1990s. Uh, in 2007, this is after September 11th, obviously, uh, they changed their name to Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, and they play a major part in the Fourth Rebellion. Major role in the Fourth Rebellion. And that was the fact that there were some Tuareg that agreed to the, the, uh, the mediation, and there were some that didn't. Uh, and the ones that didn't uh, ended up joining uh, the group that was more Islamic than secular. So um, the schism actually uh, formed the Niger Mali uh, Touareg Alliance, ATM, and that later became the Movement National pour la Liberation de l'Azouad, the MNLA. And 
in March 21st, 2012, the Fourth Torah Rebellion starts. Um, the coup d'etat of uh, President Treor was carried out, and uh, the secularist MNLA um, took over all of northern Mali. Um, helping in taking over northern Mali was the uh, Ansar al-Din, which was the Islamic, uh, the opposite, I guess you could say, of MNLA. Um, the more uh, affiliated to Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. So uh, the Tuareg declared Northern Mali to be the independent state of Azawad, something they've wanted since the First Rebellion. And again, there's uh, the independent state of Azawad that they declared and they seceded to. So um, Iyad Agali uh, was a Tuareg, and he was the one who actually ends up starting Ansar al Din. He was not allowed to join the MNLA, and this was due to his ties to Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. And um, he actually created the Salafist group, Ansar al-Din, Defenders of the Faith, uh, because of it, because he wasn't allowed to join uh, Akim, uh, I'm assuming the uh, MNLA. So uh, the MNLA and Ansar al-Din disagreed on Azawad being secular, and this was after they did the secessionist movement. Um, Ansar al-Din tried to trick them into thinking that it would be a secular country at the last minute in the negotiation process and the the uh, the document they were creating uh they put in there that it, yes it would have sharia law and it would be an islamic country and uh, that's when negotiations pretty much fell apart so uh why would the mnla uh be secular the reason why is because you have other ethnicities in azawad and even though um and i say azawad because it may end up being Northern Mali again, but we'll say Azawad for our purposes. Um, you have the Songhai, you have the Moors, uh, which are kind of Arabs, but not really. Um, you have the Pule, Fulani, you have the Bozo, the Dogon, and the Bambara, and not all are Muslims. And because of that, they, I think they understand that that would cause some divisiveness, and it wouldn't be uh, something that would work in their area. So uh, Ansar al-Din has connections to Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, the monotheism movement for jihad in West Africa, and the Nigerian group uh, Boko Haram. Um, this research was done toward the end of November 2012, and since then there have been many changes. Um, and, and there were others that I didn't see coming uh, based on my research. Um, so what happens is Ansar al-Din and al Qaeda Islamic Greb, as well as other Islamic radicals, pushed the MNLA out of Azawad, and it became a launching pad, at least that was the fear, I think, of France, uh, that it became a launching pad for Islamic terrorism, and, and that's probably one of, the reason, one of the reasons why France got involved. One of the other reasons why France probably got involved was due to uh, their uh, interest in Niger and uh, uranium mining. So France and Algeria came in, and they pushed the Islamic radicals back out of Azawad, and the fighting continues along the border of, of, of uh, northern Mali. So now what the question remains whether Azawad will go back to the country of Mali or to the Tuareg. And um, what it looks like at this point from latest uh, uh, review is that the French president, uh, Francois Hollande, uh, has decided that uh, he's going to keep the cr troops in the country and, uh, and, and uh, wait until uh, you have a UN-type peacekeeping force come in and take over after uh, the French have stabilized the country. Uh, so reviewing the history of the four Tuareg rebellions shows that ideology played a huge role. Um, you had the Islamist ideology, you had the secular ideology, you had authoritarian ideology, and you had the democratic ideology. Now, when I talk about democratic ideology, I'm not talking about uh, the United States Democratic. It's it's uh, it's more like uh, the the Arabs world Democratic, which means that the people make certain decisions. It's more like secularism or uh, uh, autonomy. That type of thing is really what I'm talking about. Not so much the um, not so much the Republican Democratic ideology we see in the United States. role uh, Mali using the authoritarian role and you had the Tuareg that wanted to use the democratic autonomic role um, 
Islamic ideology didn't play much of a role because most Tuareg are a mixture of Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice. This is a good time to talk about what that means. So because of the fact that it is an Islamic uh, culture, but they, they do have an underlying uh, pre-Islam uh, kind of a Sufism, uh, they're, they're, a lot of them are Sufi, which uh, in, in the eyes of a lot of the Salafists uh, isn't real Islam, isn't true Islam. Uh, they look at it as being a heresy, um, a Sufism anyway. So if you look at the fact that they're Muslim by chance, there's some that choose to be Muslim, and then there's some that are just because it's in that culture and everyone else is a Muslim, then they're Muslim. So uh, they're not strict adherents. They're not, if you were to compare them to, for instance, the Saudi government, uh, they are not like, uh, they are not Wahhabist by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, they would be probably on the opposite end of the spectrum, but they are Muslim. So don't say they're not Muslim, they are. Uh, they're just Muslims by chance and Muslims by choice. And that's a good way to describe them. So then you have the third and fourth Tuareg rebellions. Um, the ideological difference between the two Tuareg leaders, you had Iyad Agali, who was the Islamic Salafist, and he started the uh, uh, Ansar al-Din. And then Muhammad Agnajam was a secularist for MNLA. And so the, the ideological differences between those two Tuareg leaders really, I, I think, played a big part in the third and fourth Tuareg rebellions. So policy recommendations. Um, U.S. and other countries have oil and uranium interests, not so much oil as there is uranium in Niger, um, uh, mainly France, with the, uh, the, the, the company called Areva. Uh, in, in uh, Niger, that there's a huge concern about uh, the Salafists uh, taking over that area. So uh, that's why France is involved now. Uh, but there is a concern about the Salafist movements within the area. And uh, I think that uh, you must prepare to understand that role that ideology plays between the different people involved in those areas, especially when dealing with resolving the conflict and negotiating for uh, whatever it is, peace or um, whatever the outcome should be. Uh, subject matter experts should understand the impact of ideology. Uh, culture is important, religion is important, uh, ideology is kind of a mixture of culture, religion, and politics. So if you understand all three of those uh, in the area of all sides involved and how the interaction works, that should uh, provide a, a good background for dealing with a lot of those uh, incidents. So uh, also, there should be lessons learned databases if they're on already, and, uh, include, and it should include historical research on the role of ideology. And uh, it should be set up in such a way where you could cull information. You can look at this information and figure out, um, you know, maybe you compare the Tuareg and the Mali government's rebellion with some other rebellion in another part of the Middle East, Africa. Asia, pretty much anywhere in the world, um, if you can match up the ideologies or at least the, uh, the similar ideologies. Um, there may be some similarities there that would help you in that situation. So I think that a lesson learned database would be a good idea if it isn't already created. Um, and the policy should be created for contingencies between brewing conflicts. A lot of times we can see a lot of these conflicts brewing. And and uh, at the time, it's not a huge concern because it hasn't uh, popped, you know, it hasn't, uh, hasn't led to any kind of violent conflict, but you can see it going on. And it might be important to maybe try to stop it at the pass, so to speak. Um, so uh, that could actually, especially in areas where there's U.S. interests or other countries' interests, uh, it, it should be important to be more proactive in preventing or at least mediating those brewing conflicts. It. And what that basically means is it, it explains why they want autonomy and why they want secularism. They feel that if they have someone, and again, ideology, for the most part, when it comes to religion, uh, the reason why religion was created was to control from what uh, a lot of the ideological scholars say. So in their mind, uh, to have someone over them, to control them, uh,
And I think that it, it's really a necessary for their survival. slash autonomous. And again, remember that's which are pretty much the same thing. Um, and then uh, negotiations throughout the rebellion started out with Mali using an authoritarian ideological role. Um, mediation by Algeria was successful because it respected Tuareg autonomy and traditions. And the schism between the two Tuareg groups created a sectarian conflict. Um, after the coup of se uh, success and secession of northern Mali into Azawad, Salafist ideology prevented collaboration between the secular and the Islamist group, MNLA and uh, Ansar al -Din, respectively. Uh, Salafis took over Azawad. They pushed out the Tuareg and destroyed historic Islamic sites, Sufi, and that's something we didn't talk about yet, but basically in Timbuktu, they destroyed some tombs of Sufi saints. And, uh, and when it comes to uh, Islamists, which are Salafists, they have a saying, uh, every Salafist is a Wahhabist, but not every Wahhabist is a Salafist. Uh, Salafis, uh, the 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 Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, the the different um, Islamic groups actually destroyed these sites because they believe it's heretic, it's a heresy, it's not true Islam, it's not um, uh, based on their their belief system, uh, actual Islam. So in conclusion, uh, if you research the role that ideology plays in a conflict, uh, at least from looking at this research, it can help you better understand why the conflict occurred, and explains results from the conflict. And uh, I argue that it's, not a, uh, it's no longer acceptable to look at conflict through a pra pragmatic ways. And, and we're one of the only countries that has this, and that's the separation of church and state. Um, while it does protect religion and it protects secularists, a lot of times it prevents a lot of these solutions that could be used to solve a lot of these problems that the underlying problem is ideology or religion. And uh, so that is something to understand. Uh, through a better understanding of the situation, the people and the issues, as well as ideologies, future peace is possible. And uh, I think it's endemic for academia to concentrate your efforts on understanding the other, which is what uh, our job is in social science. And uh, that will prevent or pro prolong, uh, excuse me, that will prevent and, and possibly uh, stop uh, the conflict in various regions throughout the world. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions. I see Great. I have a few here already. Yeah, we sure do. I'll go ahead and read those to you. The, uh, Carl Prinslow, our director, says he's, he's somewhat familiar with the influence and the role that the Marabou have in, uh, in Senegal. Uh, is it approximately the same in Mali, or what are the similarities, and how is their presence in society and politics different than in uh, Mali? You know, I'm I'm not familiar with with Senegal, unfortunately. Uh, how how the uh, how that works with the Marabout in Senegal? Um, are you are you familiar with that at all? Ask him the second half of the question. What, what role do they play in the society or politics in Mali today? <laughs> you may have heard uh, Carl screaming from the other office. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the, the demute button. So, so how is it uh, in the Maraboots in the, uh, how do other ethnic groups, and specifically the, the Marabou, in, do they operate in uh, Mali? It's it's not it's not apparent that uh, the, the the Marabouts that I talked about were primarily during the Omeyyad dynasty. It doesn't appear that there is any type of uh, Islamic leadership within the at least the Tuareg uh, groups. Uh, not that I found through any research anyway. Um, that would be something interesting to look at to, because that is one of the important points I think when you look at. Um, for instance, with the Islamist, what mosque they go to, what leader they follow. It's not always whether they're a Salafist. It's uh, also whether 
uh, you know, which which imam they follow. Um, it'd probably be the same thing with the Tuareg. Uh, if you know, if they have mosques there, you know, which which Sufi uh, leader do they follow there? Um, it, it, I'm not sure about that. That would be something uh, interesting to to research though. Globalization is often seen as a resistance to help uh, to, to beat back this trend of global, global globalization. Uh, like in Nigeria, Sharia becomes the form of resistance. How is it that the you seem to imply that the Tuaregs have been insulated from this identity crisis. Uh, it, is it really a non-Sharia militancy, or is there some other insulation that's kept them from using uh, which, whichever, uh, whether it's a religion or some other form of resistance to uh, the globalization? That's a great question. I, I think uh, when it comes down to globalization, I think that for the most part, Northern Mali has been looked at as kind of this this tribal uh, desert, this no man's land, and it hasn't had as much impact uh, from globalization as the rest of the world has seen, uh, including Southern Mali. Um, it, it, it's it's interesting because if you look, look at why the there, there's not this radical Islamization within uh, the Tuareg, it, it more than likely has a lot to do with their uh, the, their pastoral nomadic uh, type of habits, but I but I think also it may have a lot to do with the fact that uh, you have a lot of different groups living in the area, and there is this kind of a uh, live and let live philosophy among them, where they they don't want to interfere with someone else's beliefs or or their way of doing things, and it's kind of like the the only way that for them to live together because there's so many different types of of people uh, with different um, ideologies, different types of uh, belief systems. Sufi than they are just uh, regular Islam, which Sufis seem to be more spiritual rather than the, if you look at the Salafist uh, type movement, uh, they're more about the uh, fundamental interpretive version of the Quran with uh, no deviation. Okay, and here's a question from our own uh, Dr. Claire Metellitz. Uh, she's our regional functional scholar for Africa. Uh, you say that, that understanding culture is a big issue, but recently uh, senior officials uh, in the military have said that the reason things went wrong in Mali was because U.S. training didn't teach the Malian troops uh, military ethos. Uh, what do you think of that sort of contradiction? So I understand. So the United States uh, military didn't teach the Malian military military ethos. Is that what you said? The, it didn't. There wasn't adequate that they were teaching them the uh, military ethos, but not not to the extent that was needed. You say that the blame is more on uh, not understanding the culture there, but the senior officials seem to say that the, the problems that we didn't teach them uh, enough of a military ethos to overcome this. Correct me if I'm wrong, Claire. Yeah. I I I, th I think you're correct. Uh, I think that's correct. Um, and uh, I I want to say that it's probably both. They're both correct <laughs> because uh, if you look at if you look at the the way that Mali uh, approached the first rebellion, they really just drew off of what I think they saw happen in other areas at the time, or that they they knew maybe from history, looking at Soviet type of. Uh, authoritarian uh, uh, ideology. So um, I, my guess would be that based on the fact that, first of all, they had trouble with routinization, and it's even continued up into the Fourth Rebellion, just dealing with basic government services in, in northern Mali, I think that it really did come from uh, a, a combination of the two, not understanding the culture, um, actually not not wanting to maybe even provide autonomy or understanding that that would cause, cause to be a, a, a divisive element within the Tuareg culture, as well as uh, not knowing how to militarily handle 
the uh, the uprising in the fourth rebellion. I, I think that I think that's a valid point. Uh, I think that I think that both the culture and the uh, the lack of military ethos would probably be a, a good a good reason why. Uh, I don't know that I would agree that it's just military ethos um, because it does appear, if you look at it, that uh, they they the Malian government from the first rebellion. Uh, didn't seem to understand uh, what the Tuaregs wanted. Either that or they didn't care, but I'm not sure which one it was. Or it may be a little bit of both. The, uh, right. <laughs> one more question, Brian, and this is based on my own ignorance of it, so forgive me if, it, if it's a dumb question. You say that the, the, the Malims are, are uh, Muslim by chance. Uh, how do... Well, based on the, the Muslim by chance and Muslim by choice uh, actually came from talking to the, 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 the expert on the Tuaregs, uh, Hamed Lalu. But um, basically, from what I understand, there is a, a lot of the Islam, uh, Islamic ideology, the, the basic Muslim things that goes on there. Um, the difference is, for instance, um, if you go to a... Uh, a strictly Islamic um, country such as Saudi Arabia or or maybe even to Syria or um, uh, say Jordan. Uh, Jordan's a little more liberal, but um, you will see that if someone's a Muslim, they will do the five pillars of Islam. And when it comes to the Tuareg, uh, they may not do the five pillars. They may not do the Hajj. They may not. Um, they may not fast. They may not do five prayers a day, um, uh, you know, towards Mecca and the Kaaba. Um, there's there's some things that they don't do, and that may come a lot more from their embrace of the Sufi uh, version of Islam, which appears to be more spiritual uh, than uh, than so much a, a uh, kind of a submission that Islam usually is. Okay, and just one more thing, if, if my, my dreaded question at the end of all these is, what is it that you would like, just the one thing that you would like someone to take away from your, your research in this, in this uh, presentation? Well, I think, I think it really comes down to, um, I mean, when it comes down to it, it comes down to uh, probably indivisibility, um, you know, divisiveness. If you look at a lot of these conflicts, and, and the, the overall reason why a lot of these conflicts happen where ideology plays a major role, there's a unwillingness on one part or the other to compromise. Uh, it, it causes a divisiveness. And uh, for instance, if you look at the First Rebellion, if the uh, Mali government were to give autonomy to the Tuaregs, would it have changed things? Would it have made them uh, maybe less rebellious towards Mali? If, if Mali had uh, been able to uh, be better at the routinization effort in northern Mali, would things have changed? Um, some people would say yes, but then I think some people would also say that uh, you also look at the fact that maybe the Tuareg would look at that as a weakness. So um, it's, it's really hard to gauge, I think, uh, based on looking at the, the, the role that ideology plays in a lot of these conflicts. It's easy to sit back and money morning quarterback it and say, well, they should have done this or should have done that. And that's something I'm not going to do because I, I think that, uh, and, and I don't think that people should do that because it's really hard to say, uh, especially when you're dealing with so many variables, whether something like that um, would, would make any sense. Um, but I, I think the most important thing to understand is when you look at ideology, uh, the divisiveness of the ideology is more than likely uh, the, the reason why the conflict happened, uh, with the exception of the fact that you do have dependent variables, and, and uh, that's one thing that I think I forgot to go too much into. Uh, the dependent variable, based on the fact that the reason why Islamists were in the region of Mali, and one of the things I forgot to mention, uh, <laughs> is that uh, it wasn't just based on the fact that the Salafists wanted to come in, it was because the Mali, because the Mali government didn't provide this routine services, these social programs, it created a vacuum 
And in that vacuum, you had the Islamists who were willing to step in. And when they stepped in, they provided economic uh, and financial things as well as something halal. And, uh, and, and there's, there's, some, uh, there's some incidents that have happened over time, people being killed where money disappears and it's attributed to that, uh, to, to that whole um, uh, concept of hawala, which is a, a currency exchange uh, within the, the Islamist groups. So I think you might see something similar. Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at. For instance, if you were to compare what happened in Mali to uh, what's going on now in Palestine, you have Hamas that came in and they filled a vacuum that was left by the Fatah, and uh, what they what they did is they were able to provide those services that the you know the PLO that later became the Fatah um, uh, that they weren't able to provide, and so I think that's something interesting. That I think hopefully Molly learned. Uh, in, in this uh, last rebellion is that uh, that's exactly what's going to happen when you don't provide the services and the, the, uh, the people. Mm -hmm.